you know, you grew up in Tennessee, right? Mm-hmm. Born and raised. How many people? Hills of Crossville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. How many people live in Crossville, Tennessee? Oh, about seventy-five hundred. I guess. That's more than I thought. I thought you were going to say about 75. No, no, no. There's 7,500 people there. There's a consolidated high school that takes in the whole county, of which that county's a mother boy. It's the largest county in the state, fourth largest county in the state of Tennessee. And uh, people come in. The time zone, by the way, goes right through there. Central and eastern. That's like Crossville's claim to fame. So uh, over here on this side of the street? Right on. The school started at 8 o'clock in the town of Crossville, which is in central uh, time zone. And over 10 miles to the east of us, there's people uh, where by their clock, school starts at 7, and they've got to get up an hour earlier. I used uh. to laugh at them. Morning radio's paying me back for that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. <laughs> All right. Now, what did your family do? I mean, what kind of people uh, are Not radio okay. personalities, right? No, 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 no. Mama was a nurse. Uh, and... Uh, Worked uh, on a private duty basis in the hospitals. Uh, well, there's only one hospital in Crossville. And uh, Daddy was uh, a railroader. Okay. You bet. When I was, um, oh, I guess about seven or eight years old, Daddy had an accident on the railroad and uh, broke his neck. Huh? Uh, it was a minor break. You know, I guess as minor as any time you break your yeah, neck right. can be. But uh, bottom line was he was off from work for a couple of months. And uh, there was some switch yards there in Crossville, and when the train would be there, Daddy would take me down uh, to the switchyards and see a bunch of his old railroad buddies, and if the right engineer was on the train, I'd get to ride on his lap and help All drive right. the train. And uh, we'd go through the crossing in, on Main Street in mm-hmm. Crossville, Tennessee, and I'd see some kids that I went to school with sitting down in the car. Blow I'd that reach whistle. Up, blow the whistle to them, <laughs> wave, school, school the next day, say, hey, see am, me in the train? Am I cool? Or what? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, what, what, all right, when, when did you decide that you wanted to get into radio? Because I, you know, oh, what made I you really wanted, didn't. Um, what made you want to get into radio? Well, uh, do you know much about small market radio? Little bitty town yeah, radio. Yeah. Uh, well, th- there was uh, two radio stations there. One was an AM FM. Uh, one was a little 250 watt AM, meaning that uh, you could only get it at the city limits and precious few miles beyond that. <laughs> Uh, came on when the sun came up, so that time varied month to month, mm-hmm. as did the time it signed off, which was when the sun went down. Uh, you know, he'd play the uh, Dixie when he came on and play the Star Spangled Banner when he uh, signed uh, off, you know, uh, yeah, but yes. like the TVs used to do at midnight, you know, but this was at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, except uh-huh. in February, then it was 4.30. Uh, the guy that owned that radio station, uh, old nearsighted knock kneed dude named Matt Johnson, never forget him, paid me a dollar and sixty cents an hour to... <laughs> which was minimum wage at the time, to come mm-hmm. in and play gospel music on Sunday mornings. He used high school kids to do his uh, part-time flunky, take out the trash and come yeah. here when I've got too big a hangover to do it work. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he called my mom and dad and said, don't you all have a son? They said, sure. I said, well, you reckon he'd like to be a disc jockey? And they asked me. I said, Are you kidding? Yeah. And uh, at that point, I'd planned on being a high school band director. So that kind of petered out about the third <laughs> semester of college. And I said, maybe radio's not that bad an idea. <laughs> maybe it's not that sleazy a way to make a living. Let me try. <laughs> and then you found out. <laughs> <laughs> then I found out that indeed it was that sleazy a way. And here we are today. All right. Now, how long did you work in Crossville? Mm, through high school. Pardon my swallowing here. Body sounds on the radio. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yes. It's live. Uh... I, I was there through high school and uh, uh, went off to college for a little bit. Keep in mind, this WCSV, uh, WCSV thing was in 1969. That's uh, October 26th. It'll be 18 years ago, if you're counting. Uh, and so off to, off to college for three semesters, back to the other station that was there, which was an AM, FM. 100 bucks a week there. Boy, I was in tall cotton. Uh, I was there for about a year and a half, working from 9 to noon, 1 to 4, and 6 to 11, uh-huh. six days a week, carrying out the trash, selling advertising, covering news stories, and trying to get along with the boss's old lady who was the assistant general manager. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That was your biggest job. That was a strange little trip. Oh, her sister was the receptionist. His brother was the morning man. It okay. was uh, one of those deals, you know, where if you got one person in the station mad at you, the whole place hated you. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I was there for a year and a half, got fired. Um, eventually ended up in Nashville, Tennessee. I was there for uh, a good long while and did fairly well. Like country in Nashville? No, uh uh-uh. Country music's an export in Nashville. Rock and roll does real well there. Uh, then what? Uh, I ended up in Florida for about 10 months. God, I hated that. 
the average age in Florida is about 53 years old. Oh, sure. Or a little older, perhaps. You know, somebody, you know, the light in front of you, are sitting at the light. There's one car before you at the mm -hmm. light. The light turns green. You honk, no, don't honk your horn. The no, guy died. <laughs> right. The guy just died. The most prosperous business along the uh, uh, <laughs> Gold Coast of Florida are funeral homes. Man, they got yep. those like McDonald's here. Yep. They have drive through viewing windows at these damn funeral homes in Florida. I hated Florida. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was with my first wife then, too, so that kind of tainted my impression of it, no doubt. <laughs> All right, fl after Florida. Oh, after Florida. Well, after about 10 months in hell, I <laughs> went uh, uh, to work for an old program director I'd worked for in Nashville who had radio bummed his way around down to Houston, and I was in Houston for about five years. And did, uh, well, just like I did here, I came and did afternoons for a little while, and then they put me on the morning show for some, because general managers and program directors are very sadistic, and they like to fic, uh, pick on fat people. Pick, pick is pick, word, yes. Pick on, <laughs> pick on fat people, pick on fat people, whatever. Anyhow, you know, they, they, they like to make my life miserable, so okay. they put me on mornings, and I'm up at 4 o'clock every morning in Houston for five years, and then up here, and the rest has just been broadcasting uh, mania. So, where, all right, where did Moby come from? Oh, I've been Moby since I was 12. Um, Mama's? Huh? Mama's nickname for you or friends? No, or? no, no. There was uh, some lifeguards at uh, the state park in my hometown uh -huh. that would let me in swimming free. I was 12 years old. Too young to get a job. Even a part-time summer job. They got, you know, child labor laws and yeah. I couldn't really do anything. So these college students that were lifeguards would let me in swimming free and I'd go get their french fries and orange crushes. And mm -hmm. uh, they would talk to me. K kids my age, other 12-year-olds that were at the park, would uh, uh, also be at the be at the beach, you know, and trying to talk to these uh, lifeguards and stuff because they thought it was cool and I was their buddy. They'd take me skiing and stuff. So mm -hmm. they heard the lifeguards calling me a name. They started calling me a name. In uh, my high school senior annual, 1971, by the way. How many of you were even born then? Uh, <laughs> my senior annual in 1971. Uh, by my picture, it says Moby Carney. Which does is it really? Mm -hmm. Sure does. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of Santa Moby in that senior annual, too, I might add. So it's been with me a long time. All right. Now, you were, uh, I'm sure a lot of the people that are going to be calling tonight uh, saw the Oprah Winfrey show. Yeah. And the discussion, I, I want to get this discussion out and over with, and then we'll start taking some calls. Now, I didn't like the, uh, I, by the I, just for the record, I didn't like the Oprah Winfrey show. It was, you know, to begin with, there was no real topic. She had six or seven morning disc jockeys around there, which was probably six or seven of the largest egos in America yeah. on a totally ad-lib basis. Especially the, the guy that was on the far right. Jonathan Brandmeier yeah. of WLUP in well, Chicago. No, well, no, not just Brandmeier, but who was the guy that was from L.A.? Oh, uh, Jim, put his number Jim Poor Man Trenton was yeah. his name. He was an all right guy. Was he? Yeah, and Brand Meyer stole the show uh, yeah, from okay. WLUP. The thing was produced in Chicago, the show was. Uh, he's a morning man in Chicago, and he had given away tickets to the Oprah Winfrey show all oh. week. It was his crowd, you know. Okay. It'd be like if they produced it in Dallas, and I gave away tickets to come see the videotaping at, mm -hmm. uh, over the Eagle here. Mm -hmm. The place would be full of Kid Craddock fans. Okay, our number is 7871-9071, 7871-971. Now, the discussion got around to the type of radio and i'm not going i don't see i don't include you in that type quote unquote radio that uh, nasty radio yeah because i mean there's a, a definite difference and i'm not sure how many of the listeners are aware of a howard stern in new york city um uh, and that kind of show compared to what moby does on the air well i like to think it's different uh to begin <laughs> see, to, begin, to begin with i don't think i'm as smart as howard stern is i think he's uh uh, almost like a uh, X-rated scientist. <laughs> he's, he's really a funny guy, but uh, I, I question some of the things he chooses to do on the air. But that's not—that's neither here nor there. You know, if if that was a problem, then my uh, my stance of well, if you don't like it, there's a whole bunch of alternatives wouldn't hold water. Uh, the the main thing that I guess confuses me or uh, is curious to me about Howard Stern's success and other jocks like him is their. Uh, apparent disrespect for their audience. Uh, I, I like to make people feel like when they're listening to the morning show that they're listening to their old buddy Moby. They can call in, they'll find somebody that might joke around with them, yeah. might give them a little crap, but yeah. uh, all, all in good humor, and will uh, actually feel guilty if he, if he was to hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, uh, Stern is, is uh, uh, very acidic to his listeners and, and shows them no respect at all. And I don't necessarily think that's 
Uh, not, not the way you do radio. But then again, you can't argue with his success. Why wasn't Stern on the Oprah Winfrey show? He was asking. He said no. Really? So talk to my agent. How much does it pay? <laughs> the guy's been on national TV before. It wasn't that big a deal to him. Yeah. Me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what do, you, what do you think about things? I mean, the, the, you know, the question always in conversations that I've had with people, it comes up, would Moby let his little boy, if his little boy was 13 or 14, listen to what Moby does in the morning. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Moby in the Morning show, in my mind, is not geared toward 13-year-old boys or girls. Yeah. Or 14, or for that matter, even directly targeted at 15 or 16. Yeah. The uh, listener I have in my mind's eye, and the ratings will bear me out on their presence in the Morning Show audience, are people all 18 to 49 uh, certainly adults, by and large successful adults, mm -hmm. if not necessarily successful financially, at least successful in attitude, and uh, I mean, uh, that, that in people that enjoy a, a good joke and that aren't offended by the word damn or ass or hell or whatever else happens to fit into the flow of conversation on the program. Well, you're not talking to 13-year-olds any more than you're talking to 65-year-olds. Yeah, but there's a few of both of them. we got old uh, Opal Drury yeah. in Como. Yeah. <laughs> She's 62. <laughs> of course, she may be lying. She might be 65. She you know how those old ladies that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Now, just radio in general. What do, you, what do you think about radio in general today? Now, you and I grew up in the days of when... I mean, we've been in radio for the same length of time. I'm really? Ahead. You're I, as old I, as I am? I, You're I'm, older than I am. I'm older than okay, you are. I like that. Go ahead. I'm, in fact, I've got you by about three months. So in radio, yeah, and the the gray hair here and the mustache is that first three months. <laughs> so ninety more days, I'm going to look like that. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, no, hope I'm that thin. <laughs> um, but it was days of, I mean, there was you know there was a certain portion of contest and that kind of thing. And as opposed to radio here, let's gear it towards music a little bit. Okay. When when you and I got into radio, the Beatles were still together. Sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. for several years thereafter, as a matter of fact. But uh, I didn't have the opportunity to play any rock and roll till uh, full seventy four. Okay. I was playing country, and and what rock and roll I was playing was very limited. Uh, I was playing country. Uh, I played gospel. I uh, spent a year playing big band music. I've done that. Uh, <laughs> Swing and Sway with Sammy K. Yeah, yes. and then in 1974, I went to uh, FM 103 in Nashville, which still is the dominant station there by a mile. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first rock and roll I played. Okay. But, uh, but, uh, so I, don't, I, you know, I really don't feel any allegiance to any kind of music. What do you go home and listen to? Television, generally. Or I read or play with my kid. I don't, I don't sit around and listen to records much. I got a CD player and a few CDs. And, you know, I got a record player and some records. Mm -hmm. And I got a tape player and some tapes. But, I mean, it's just there. I don't use it much. Kelly, my wife, listens more to it than I do. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, music to me, it's, I mean, it's not that I don't enjoy it. I get in the car and I'll punch around on the radio. And I'll, I ser seriously listen to The Eagle. I love Kid Craddock's show. Mm -hmm. I think Julie Patterson hung the moon. She's the sweetest thing in the world. And knowing her makes me appreciate her show even more. Uh, but but the time still gets on. You know, it's 6 o'clock in the night. That That's getting Close to be... Close to bedtime. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in bed by 10. And, geez, that's late evening for me. You know, I sit down watching news. I'll catch Vanna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if, I can, if I can find Robin somewhere, I'll watch him, see what the rich and famous are doing. Uh -huh. And then I'm ready for bed. All right. All right. Well, let's, are you ready to take some calls? That's your show, Bubba. It's fine with me. 7871-971 is another. Are they ringing? Or? Uh, yeah, we're, we're ready to go here. When they're blank is when your heart stops. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're on the Eagle. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to tell Moby uh, two things. One is I like his show, and I'm from Tennessee, too. Yeah, there you go. What part of Tennessee are you from, sir? Uh, Martin and Union City. Martin, that's up in East Tennessee. Uh, well, it's 120 miles north of Memphis. That's West Tennessee. Uh -huh. You try to act like you know to make the kid feel good, and he screws you on it. It's at the other end of the state. Sorry. Well, I've listened it's to, a great state. Yeah, I've listened to 103 out in Nashville a lot. Really? Yeah, I just moved here about two months ago. Well, good. How do you like Texas? Win something on your show since then. You did what? I've been trying to win on your show to get... Yeah, well, fat chance, kid. No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. That's, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Good luck to you. Know, you know what? Let me tell you something, son. Now, it's tough to get through here on these contests and stuff. But your odds of winning are certainly better if you keep trying than they are if you say, oh, the heck with it. I can't win and give up. So keep trying. I do like those Moby mugs, too. All right. Thanks for calling. <laughs> uh, all right. Let me ask you one other thing. What? And that one is... One other thing? We've got a half an hour. Uh, no, I'm expecting I mean, a long the, question. The, the callers are going to take care of that. Okay. 
you have, and I, I'm, I don't think you really want, will want to get into this too much, but I want to bring it up just simply because yeah, I think it needs to be brought up, is the fact that you have taken a um, very strong stand on drugs. Yes. And, I have. I mean, and I, I, th I think that the parents that are the staunch, and by and large, parents aren't staunch detractors. You know, you got the Arlington PTA that got organized, and that's been the only organization that I've seen. But uh, parents, by and large, I think should really appreciate the message that I try to put out. But it's, you know, it's pretty universal now. Uh, the, 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 the plain cold fact that it is certainly uncool to drink and drive. But you Drawing, do, doing drugs is just pretty poison. You don't know they got you till they got you, and then it's too doggone late. So Molly, yes, you have felt this way for a long time. Yeah, I've been on this bandwagon from way back since when it wasn't cool. Okay. What, what was it? What started it? Well, <laughs> gosh, it goes, I mean, I mean it seriously goes way back. I was involved with Big Brothers in Nashville uh, in 70, oh gosh, what was that? About 73, I guess. I was involved with Big Brothers, and certainly that, that was my stance then. Uh, but and, for somebody in rock and roll to stick their quote-unquote neck on the line and other things and risk, like you said, I mean, at the time that you started talking about drugs being not cool, drugs... They were still cool. Unquote, John, John Belushi cool. was still smoking uh, joints yeah. on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so, that's uh, just, you know, it's always been my shtick. You know, I, I've never really been a trend follower or a trend setter. You know, I'm just Moby, and that's just been always what I was the most comfortable with. And uh, that's what I always tried to uh, project on the air. And if it came out, well, fine. If it don't, well, to hell with it. You know, I'll move along. <laughs> well, <laughs> the ratings will show it eventually. Well, I've seen, uh, or I've heard you do the same thing, like with kids and that will call you up thinking that it's cool that they're skipping school that particular <laughs> yeah. day. Right. And uh, five minutes later when they're... <clears throat> a little bit uh, smaller than they were when they first called. Because I blasted them. Uh, yeah. Right? yeah. I, I, so they said, get your ass to school, son. Yeah. So it's your only job is to go to school a few hours a day. Go on. You've got strong feelings about this stuff. Well, and I sure. think that, you know, people... I try to be a good influence to kids. Good grief, you know. If I'm telling them dirty jokes, it's going to get them in trouble in homeroom. The least I can do is get them there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. More calls. 7871-971. It's okay is to the tell number. those in study hall, but not homeroom. That's right. You're on the Eagle. Uh, Moby, Rich, how y'all doing? It's good. Good. Who is this? This is Hooman. Hooman? Hooman, yeah. Hi, Hooman. I eat at your restaurant all the time. The great food. <laughs> all right. I love Chinese food. Well, who's the new girl tonight? The new girl? That, that's Karen. That's our producer. Oh, no. that sounds cute. <laughs> but anyway, I got a question and a comment. Okay, one question. Uh, Moby, where did you learn all those jokes? <laughs> Oh, man, it's just uh, attrition more than anything else. Um, you do know every joke in the world. Well, I've got a pretty wide vocabulary of jokes. How do you... But uh, listen, I've been, I've been doing morning radio since uh, 81, and four hours a day, five days a week, that whole time, I'd give a nickel for every time I've heard, hey, Moby, got a joke for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. But and your retention of the jokes is incredible. It's the setup more than the punchline, though. I, if somebody said, hey, Moby, why don't you lay a couple of jokes on us? I'd have to stop and think about it. But if somebody tries to tell me one, I can remember the punchline pretty easily, seems like. <laughs> well, I think I have still one that, that you don't know, but I'll... I'll it's a that. gift from God. <laughs> I'll tell you that in the morning. I've been blessed. I saw Billy Gibbons in a bowl of oatmeal once. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, I've been able to remember jokes. I can't under, I can't explain really? it better than that. Oh, really? Yeah. But um, also, um, you know, I'm an, I'm a radio and TV major in uh, college. Why? Uh, why, really? <laughs> why? Well, I think I can. My, minor in that. Major in something in case you decide you don't like it. You got something real you can do. Well, I think I'll I'll think I'll do just fine. But um, you know, I've listened to a lot of the morning shows on the other uh, you know stations just for the heck of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not. I mean, they just turn me off. I mean, you know, I don't know. When, when I listen to The Eagle in the morning, uh, it tends to keep my interest more. Even though, um, you know, people complain about, oh, Moby, he says uh, dirty words on the radio and stuff. I think that's ridiculous, you know. I think that's what sets apart, you know, The Eagle from a lot of other things. And just uh, pretty much, you know, being, being, you know, having a attitude that... You know, being close to the people. You know what I mean? Well, try to be relatable to the people anyhow. You know, those people that are offended and say I say dirty words are also the people that probably say poo-poo and wee-wee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, even when they're drinking beers, you know. <laughs> hey, boy, I just love the poo-poo out of you, you know. <laughs> hey, wow. Okay. All right, thanks for calling. No You're on the Eagle. Oh, hi, I'm Moby. Yes. 
Um, how do you get all these songs like Scotsman? Who gives you all the ideas? Well, they come from a variety of places. Uh, the Scotsman was on some radio station in Ohio, and I knew was the really? jock. Yeah, and uh, he, he I, t I said, oh, I'd love to have that, and he mailed me a copy of it. I've been playing it for years. You know, I've, I've given it to some other jocks. I'm, I don't have an exclusive to it. Texas Bitch was written by a, a dermatologist in San Antonio. <laughs> and a buddy of mine, uh, Roger Harris and myself, recorded the song. I produced that. Do you like it, Texas Bitch? you like that? Oh, yeah. I, I, I produced that personally. Where did the po song about the Pope the come Pope, from? The Pope, I wrote the Pope song. Well, i got to give credit to my, ri to my wife. She put a couple of words in it, too. What about men? Men, men, men. That was, uh, I think that's a Monty Python. Yeah. No, that's a Martin Mull or something. I'm not real sure. Oh, well, yeah. Men, men, yeah. I like that. <laughs> Tonight we sleep in separate beds and blow each other kids. <laughs> All right. Call her anything else? Uh, no, thanks. All right. Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. You're on the Eagle. Hey, movie, how's it going? Pretty well. I'm up too late. Oh, you're up late. I am too. How'd you like the Cowboys win? Well, I felt like they got real lucky. Boy, didn't they? <laughs> they got real lucky. Let me tell you what. The, it could just as easily have been a repeat of last week, and they lost it in the last minute, last couple of minutes. Yeah. When when Landry went for the touchdown and uh, and not the field goal on that play on the one yard line. Yeah. Give the ball to Herschel again. You haven't given it to him yet today, Tom. Here's a, hey, I got an idea for you. A real innovation. Why don't you give the ball to Herschel? Uh -huh. Poor Herschel. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. I got them tickets. Well, was Tony getting Landry's Cokes today? What's the deal? <laughs> Let Tony run some. He makes a mill. Uh, I got tickets for next week's game. Uh-huh. And I was wondering. We don't want to buy them. If, uh, well, yeah, but. Lay them up on your dash. Will you? Leave your car unlocked. When you come back, there'll be four tickets, Landry. Will, will you? <laughs> <laughs> what? Will they open the stadium for me? Mm. Yeah, this is Captain Haha. Ha. Yeah, I, I just recognize your voice. Yeah, there's, uh, I don't know, Captain Haha has been concerned about the strike. Because where else is he going to be able to be insane in public and yeah, not get arrested? That's right. That's right. Well, I want to go out there anyways, even if they're not going to play. To the stadium? Well, yeah, I got a ticket to go in there. Well, you'll have plenty of room to run around if they strike. Yeah, will, will they open up the stadium for me, do you know? I tell you what, if I was you, I'd just go over and rattle that gate till somebody unlocked it. Uh -huh. Yeah, until Tex. Because I got a ticket. Yeah, well, Tex will come downstairs and let you in. Okay. Uh, all right, thanks for calling. <laughs> Bye. -huh. You're on the Eagle. That guy's certifiable. Hello. This is Mary. Mary. Yes, the one that you were supposed to sign the autograph picture for. Mary, that I was supposed to sign the autograph picture for. Mary, you have to refresh my memory, sugar. I'd, uh... It was last week. It was last Monday. I was supposed to come up there. Uh huh. And I didn't make it. And I'm sorry I didn't. Well, Mary, these things happen. Well, when you get another job, you have to go. I understand that. You come along any time or send a self-addressed envelope or whatever, and I'll be glad to send you one. I'll come up and see you. Okay. Hey, Moby. Mm hmm I love waking up with you in the morning. <laughs> yes, when I roll over and goose you and say, come on, Mary, I can get up. i got to go to work. <laughs> I do that every morning. <laughs> All right, girl. Yeah, have a good day. You too. Thanks. Go to bed. You're on the Eagle. Yeah, Moby. Yes, sir. How's it going? Oh, not bad for a fat white boy. No government check coming in. <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask you, um, what kind of person were you in high school? I mean, were you like a class clown or a mm. scholar or what? Well, in my senior class, I'd like to brag and say that uh, I was elected wittiest. Wittiest? Well, it got my picture. got an extra picture in the annual, man. Come on. How many people were in this school? Uh, Let's but, narrow down the competition. No, no, no about 1,500. Were there really? Yeah, we graduated 350-something in my senior class in 71. What? what a memory I've got. Really? Yeah. So you had a picture of me, uh, Manny. An extra picture, yeah. Me and Sandra Goss, wittiest. God, she was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, it was me and her in this picture. <laughs> you know. Hey, Moby, see the picture of you and Sandra? <laughs> yeah, I saw it. Did that picture take up the whole annual? Uh, well, it took up the top half of one page, I tell you. They should put your picture all over and just say, class clown of whatever. When did you graduate? Uh, 71. Yeah. So where are you? They, I don't know. Cumberland County High School in Crossville, Tennessee. The CCHS Jets. Go Jets. Were you an A student, B student? Uh, I was a uh, high C, low B student. I didn't make the top 20 in the class. Matter of fact, of the 350-something, I was about 130, 140. Nothing to write home about. Did you get in trouble a lot? No, I never got in trouble. Teachers loved me. Yeah, but I mean, did they? I was a brown noser. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you a cup of coffee today, teacher? Yeah, right yes. on. Miss Kirkamind, I just wanted to say how lovely that dress looks today <laughs> on you. What it does for your body is really something. <laughs> Miss Kirkamind would get her cane. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks, thanks for God. calling. You're on the Eagle. Yeah, uh, a <laughs> couple minutes ago you said something about the Oprah Winfrey Show. Yeah. 
Well, I was watching the late night show. Ted Cop. Mm-hmm. And they had that Chicago DJ on there. Oh, late night with Letterman. Yeah. No, it was the one that Joan Rivers used to host. Oh, okay. Fox 33. Yeah, that was Jonathan Bramar. That was the guy that was on Oprah. Yes. Have they offered you the job yet? Can you believe it? No. Well, they are pets, aren't they? <laughs> they're what? They're the pits. Pets. They're the pits, <laughs> That's yes. That's what she said, yes. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'd really be qualified to do that or not. I, that, when, given, the, given the opportunity, I'd sure give it a shot, but I, he, I don't know if I'd really be playing in my ballpark if I tried that. Well, he didn't do too hot of a job whenever he brought the three old ladies from Florida up on the stage. Really? Yeah. We, are, we talked about them a minute ago. They were the ones at the traffic light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for calling. You're welcome. Let's talk about Oprah for a minute. What was she yeah. like? I mean, she's Oprah? Hot, she is the hottest thing going in TV. She knows days. it, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me, I think, I would have said in the morning show, she needs to move to India. They worship black cows there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oprah was, uh, she, I can't say she was uh, impolite or inhospitable, but actually her people were polite and hospitable. The people that put on the mm -hmm. show, uh, they, they uh, led us into this room and uh, uh, fed us pastries if we wanted them. Nobody ate because they look like day-old pastries. Mm -hmm. I've got an eye for food. <laughs> and coffee and um, juice. Uh, it came time for the show. They said, now, now I've, the producers have told her this was the, uh, I guess, I, I don't know what her title was. She was stepping and fetching for us. Mm -hmm. She said, I've been told by the producers to tell you that if any of you get dirty, we'll go to a commercial and take you off the set. <laughs> so, well, hmm. that's pleasant. Welcome. Uh, right on. So, <laughs> so we walk out. They put microphones on us. They sit us down on the set. And... Uh, the uh, audience, the small audience of maybe 150, 200 people, applaud. Uh, and they roll the theme song, and here comes Oprah. Uh -huh. And we talk, 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 break for commercial. They roll the theme song, and there goes Oprah. Commercials are over. They roll the theme again. Guess what? Here comes Oprah. Really? Back. When the show was over, she stayed out there maybe two minutes for pictures with her guests. And then there went Oprah. And we didn't see her no more. Really? Yep. Because, see, I mean, you get the impression that she's there the whole time and chit-chatting with you guys in the audience during commercial breaks. Just till they fade to black. <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So to speak. <laughs> that All was right. funny. Now, now, Koppel, you did that, too. Yeah. Oh, Nightline. So, Nightline. That, that, on the other hand, I, I enjoyed that. There. I, mean, I like Nightline. Ted Koppel called me a crazy SOB on national television. I loved it. <laughs> Uh, actually, but night, Nightline was great. I didn't have to leave town was one thing. Yeah. Uh, we did it from uh, ABC, uh, what do they call this, Bureau office mm -hmm. over in Arlington. And I was there. Uh, there was a guy in Washington. No, the lady was in Washington, a guy in New York, and Koppel was in Washington, I believe. And it was the three of us. I couldn't see anything but the camera lens I was looking at, but I could hear them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this IFB, I think they call it. This lady has an earplug that you put in. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, they uh, uh, we would talk during the commercial breaks. Ted Koppel would talk to me during the commercial breaks. Before we went on, he talked to me. And even after the show was over, I talked to him for a couple of minutes. He was a very nice man. Koppel's a pro, though. You bet he is. He, you bet he is. And I, I was very nervous about that because I thought, this is the guy that uh, would probably be picked to enter to the in interview the Ayatollah yeah. if the opportunity arose. Maybe he has. But and he could pick the Ayatollah to shreds. Two shreds. And I thought he was very kind to me. Yeah, yeah, I did too. I made him laugh. Yeah, I've, have you ever seen Koppel smile on Nightline? Not often. I made him smile. That was pretty hip. Very good. I got a tape of that at the house. Anybody uh -huh. wants to drop by and see it? You know, I break it out all once a day. I know that was a fun show. You were on a roll. You were on Oprah's show and Nightline. You had the CBS Evening News. Desire to do USA Today three times. That's right. You want to do TV? Oh, I don't know. I've done quite a bit of television. Well, I mean, local. On a, would you do it on a regular basis? Oh. Kind of like radio, it'd be working for a living, you know. It's, look, okay, we'll get old Saul on the phone. He'll we'll find you a yeah, job call, before call, we get Call my attack Jew up in Chicago and tell him I've changed my mind for careers. I won't be in television. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go back. Hee haw, phones. maybe. Uh, seven eight seven one ninety seven one is the number, and you're on the Eagle. Go ahead. How are you doing? Good. It's gonna be kind of hard to get up in the morning, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm sleeping on a couch up here. I brought my pillow, my toothbrush. My Lagerfeld, <laughs> so Dibble will talk to me. <laughs> My old spy stick. I'm ready to go. Well, knowing the, uh, your stand on drugs and all that, I was listening to the song, Here Comes the Pope. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking that you might already come up with some of the same beat and tempo as Say Nope to Dope. Say nope to dope. Say nope to dope. Do a parody of the Pope mm -hmm. song. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. a, <laughs> that's a good idea. Maybe we'll work on that one. I, I write by inspiration when I start writing songs. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, here comes the Pope song. I don't know. It just came out of the it, blue. How long did that take you to write? 45 minutes, maybe. Really? 
Yeah, and then there was a kid next door to me up at uh, Bendover Acres, where I live up there, that's got... Uh, uh, he's a 15-year-old kid, goes to a Catholic high school. He's got a three-piece heavy metal band. And I called him. I said, y'all know where there's a studio? And they said, yeah, Charlie Ferguson's got bullet sound over here. That's yeah, where we go. Hey, he's a little rich kid. You know. mm -hmm. said, uh, well, you reckon he'd let us sit in there? And can you boys play country? <laughs> they said they could. I said, you just became radio stars. All right. Here we go. And they loved it. You know, it's, it's uh, really uh, been great for their high school careers. Caller, anything else? Well, I'd just like to wish Mr. Moby another happy year here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I hope we can stretch it into happy several years. Oh, yeah, that's my, you know, that's my least favorite part about radio is the fact that too frequently it makes you become uh, uh, mobile. You know, it makes you move from city to city occasionally, and I don't like that. I didn't leave Tennessee because I wanted to. I left Florida because I wanted to. I was not happy there. But I didn't leave Tennessee because I wanted to. I haven't left any other city I've ever lived. I didn't leave Crossville, Tennessee because I wanted to. I like having roots. You know, that's why I guess that's what me and Alex Haley, Haley have in common. But uh, I, I would just prefer to stay here and, and live out my life, if that's all right, with everybody else. How hard was it for you to make the transition? Now, Houston to Dallas is not a huge difference as far as attitudes. and I mean, <laughs> besides distance, we're, we're close in some ways. Well, in some ways. It's in Texas. Yeah. But, I mean, but was, it, was it difficult for you to make the change from Houston up yeah. here? Not really, no. I, except I, I didn't want to really move. You know, the uh, I had some problems with the station I had down there. I was happy there. Yeah. Like I say, I don't want to move. I've been here a year. I'm as happy as a pig and slop here. I don't want to leave here. And I'll stay here as long as the uh, ratings will justify my salary. Okay. Caller, thank you very much. Uh -huh. You're on the Eagle. Moby. Yes, sir. How you doing, bud? Pretty well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Listen, this is Cliff. I work over at Braniff Airlines. I just moved up here from uh, Antioch, Tennessee. Antioch. Yeah. We used to kick y'all's butts in high school football when <laughs> I was a kid. I, di I didn't go to high school. I'm originally from Arkansas. But oh, okay. I'm kind of like you. I moved for the job. I got out of the service. But anyway, I wanted to tell you about your show, man. I really love it. Every morning, I live up here in Carrollton and down 35 through that traffic, man. Ooh. I listen to you every day. And well. as soon as I get to work, I, out of the bottom of my toolbox, I've got a small jam box, and I put it on, and I listen until you go off. And I just want to tell you, you're doing a good job, and I agree with you because I don't know what these people are all stirred up about, but my opinion is, you know, it, it's a pro and con subject. You either take it or leave it. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen to it, but... That's why they make chocolate and vanilla. That's right. All right well, I appreciate you, man. All right. You know, I was just going to say you're doing a good job, and I think it's good, clean fun myself. I love it. If you weren't there, I'd go crazy. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I'll try to keep you sane for a few more years. All right. Take care, man. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks for calling. You're on the Eagle. Yes, I just kind of wanted to ask Moby, um, is it really hard to get in to be a disc jockey, you know, to get in? I mean, I, did, I thought he was younger than what he is. I, I, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> well, I, you're, you're old, uh, older than me, and I, that kind of shocked me because I thought you was about 25. Yeah, that's right, I am. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be 30. If the good Lord lets me live to December, as my daddy used to always say, I'll be uh, 34 and on December the 9th. Write that, write that in your calendar. Send me a card, would you, honey? December the what? Ninth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Two days after Pearl Harbor. So is it, is it really hard to get in to be a disc jockey? Because you said you started when you was young. Fifteen, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I, I've seen a lot of people go through a lot of grief with it. Then again, I've seen guys, well, uh, on the Oprah Winfrey show, if you uh, if you saw that, the episode of it that I did, uh, uh, Jim Poorman Tritton that was there from K-Rock in Los Angeles had been in radio for three years. Some people just really? seem to have a natural talent at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just just uh, get all the lucky breaks, and away they go. Uh, for me, I didn't get into a, a rated situation. In other words, markets where there are ratings and where you can justify your salary and, and uh, a decent living uh, until, uh, oh, geez, 75, 6. And I'd, I'd been in it for seven or eight years already trying to crack that shell. Yeah. And also, I have another question. You know, that Captain Hall, he always calls in on your show all the time. <laughs> I know it. Does he work for the station? No, he's. I'm not real sure who employs Ha Ha, to tell you the truth. Yeah, they've been asking me to call this guy that's on this <laughs> talk show tonight, and I hear this is his last night or something. They want him to be on the talk show so they can call in and ask him questions. Yeah, get Ha Ha too? God, I hope he's turned his radio off already. He'll <laughs> never leave us alone. <laughs> well, they do. They go in. They go wild. And they, they, somebody said that he was at El Chico's at Townies, and he's changed his uniform. Is that right? He's yeah, he's got he's got a little different uh, get up this year. He's uh, wearing the cowboy colors this year instead of black and gold. I never could figure that out. Why was it black and gold at the Cowboys game? Yeah, it was it was black and gold before. What color is it now? It's uh, Cowboys cover, blue blue and silver. Oh, okay. Looks kind of sharp on him, really. I, I liked his wings better before. 
there's a bunch of us. We have a fan club. We want to. We'd like to hear him on this, you know, on your program, or maybe. Well, I'm sure we can talk Rich Bryan into staying an extra week, and he'll be on next Sunday night. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, anyway, we'd love to see him on there because we have a lot of questions we have for him. We we really love your show and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Seven eight seven one ninety seven one is the number, and you're on the Eagle. Yeah, I'm only what's that? Oh, just uh, sitting here with my buddy Richard for a few more minutes. There you go. So I haven't listened to you since you got here last year. I really enjoyed your show. And, Thank you. Uh, videotaped the Oprah show and caught that. Uh, you're always talking about you and your daddy-in-law going to the million dollars. Does that happen? Or? <laughs> well, of course it happens. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not the same after you get through with even of that, huh? Well, uh, married men appreciate the million dollar saloon a lot more than you single fellas do, let me yeah. tell you. Well, nobody said I was single. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what you're talking about. Did you hear, did you, yeah, right on. Did you, you heard about the Playboy for married men, didn't you? What's that? Got the same centerfold every month. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, uh, last time my uh, mother and father-in-law were up here to visit me, me and my daddy-in-law get along way too good. It's like we were made from the same mold or something. Yeah, right. And uh, my father passed away about, oh, two and a half years ago. And me and my daddy-in-law, Sid, uh, have gotten a lot closer since then. We went to the Million Dollar Saloon. I have some buddies that are uh, Dallas police officers. <laughs> and I said, look, about this pre-arranged time, we'll, we'll be at the Million Dollar, and uh, why don't you come, like, harass my father-in-law for me, <laughs> would you? So they show up there. We get Paige to the front. They, they put him against the wall, gently, but against the wall, search him, and palm a bag of white powder and oh, act God. like they're coming out of his pocket with it. And my daddy-in-law is so quick-witted. They says, what's this? He said, that's my protection. He looks around at it for, like, five seconds. He says, uh, that's, uh, that's my protection. Says, your protection? What do you mean, your protection? He says, well, that salt Peter, and I do a little of that about every 30 minutes, keeps me off of these stages around here. <laughs> <laughs> the cops just put it away and walked off. It was flour. <laughs> Well, uh, who designed your Moby mug that you got after giving away? Uh, I think Rich Bryan might have had a hand in that, I don't, didn't you? Yeah, I have a little bit, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the draw. Have you seen them? Yeah, I won one. Did you? Good for you. Uh, the, the drawing that's on the side's one that's been around, uh, you know, the picture that's supposed to be me. Yeah, that's, that's been around for a long time. Yeah, it doesn't really do you justice. No, I w well, actually, it does me more than justice. I was thinner <laughs> when that picture was drawn. <laughs> there you go. Say, uh, mm -hmm. With Andre Gardner coming onto the scene, what was the reason for, you know, them adding another DJ? Is somebody fixing to drop out? Or no, 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 no. Andre's another fat guy, and I was lonely. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> union or something, huh? What? Get a union. Go right. Finally, there's somebody else working here whose clothes I can borrow. <laughs> there are some true heavyweights working here now. That's right. Uh, See, our program director, uh, he's a little overweight, and uh, I've never been called thin. And uh, now Andre has got a big ass. Yeah, and and uh, by golly, I like the trend we've got going here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that jogging and health craps for the birds. <laughs> well, Craddock's a little bitty fellow. How's he gonna fit into this? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess he'll be our little buddy. There you go. He hates that. <laughs> he's the <laughs> smallest guy here. I mean, even of the secretaries, he's smaller. <laughs> uh, I guess. Well, appreciate appreciate the visit. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for calling. You're on the Eagle. Go ahead. Yeah, this is James Major. And I've been calling all weekend, and I want to thank the Eagle for advertising our Arlington High School Symphony Orchestra's car wash that we had Saturday. Sounds like you could be the conductor. Well, not conductor, but president of it. President of it? Yeah. What do you play? I play the bass. The, the bass. bass. The bass guitar? Oh, that t upright four-string gut bass? Yeah, the big one. Big I gotcha. Yeah, okay. I was in the high school band. I was going to say you guys ought to be able to talk for hours. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, matter of fact, in high school, I was a music major. Okay. What'd you What'd you play? Yeah, I, I saxophone, doubled on clarinet and flute. You ain't seen nothing funny. Do you see somebody weighs damn near three hundred pounds with a flute, <laughs> and the piccolo was even something like what? Why don't you have a solo with us at one of our concerts? It'd be a great fundraiser. Yeah, maybe. Well, you got to remember, I got out of high school in 71. I, I was music major in college, too, but I was only there for three semesters. So we're talking end of 72 was the last time I was serious about yeah. it. You still uh, fool around with your flute? No, no, no. I, well, <laughs> I'm married. I don't have to. What? Sorry? Took the place of it. Right. Um, 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 why don't you come out with a cassette of jokes? Because, I mean, I get jokes. And get rich and retire? I get joke books, and you know, it just loses something when you read them. But if you had a cassette and you were actually telling the jokes, it would be so effective. And you'd probably sell a lot of them. Hmm. If I actually do that, do you want to cut? Oh, yeah. Well, forget it, yeah. then. Uh, bad idea. <laughs> Let me know when you move out of town. <laughs> what? For the orchestra. Do what now? Give a cut to the orchestra. We'll do background music and everything. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, right. I'll put, put a little Burt Bacharach music behind uh, behind some good jokes. Thanks right. for calling, man. Thanks. Where'd you meet Kelly? Kelly Bell? Yeah. <laughs> well, the story I usually tell, I can't tell on the radio. <laughs> uh, in, in Houston, she was uh, by accident at a promotion that I was hosting uh, in Houston. We were videotaping what was going to be a TV show for the radio station I was working at there. And... Uh, now, in, in this shot, it was a it was a big ego shot. That's all it was. You know, they had the camera on me, and and I was introducing videos, and it was going to be a, a video television show. Mm -hmm. uh, in in this one particular shot, we'd invite. It was being filmed in a bar, and we were uh, uh, inviting all the women in the audience to come up and be in the shot. And they you know they gathered all around me, and they was rubbing on my mm -hmm. ear, you know, and playing with my hair and being real lovey dovey. And uh, Kelly was standing over in the shadows, and I could see her over there, tall, good-looking, redhead, and she was looking, but she, was, she obviously didn't want to participate. So when the shot was over, I walked over to her and says, uh, Hi there, what's your name? She says, I'm Kelly. Who are you? I think, now, wait a minute, who am I? Uh, <laughs> Boy, it busted my bubble big uh, time, real quick. Took me down about four or five notches right there. I think I like this girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we ended up speaking that night for quite some time. Uh, this was on a Friday, and uh, we, well, let's see, we uh, ended up splitting up that night after breakfast, about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I went out with her again the following week once. She was a real sharp girl. I was extremely impressed. This was in March uh, of 84. In August, I asked her to marry me, and we married oh. in November of that year. Why? Yeah. It That's was real mover, cool. Mr. I, I, Mover. You betcha. I, I, I proposed with a poem. Did you really? it, it, yes, it really. I, it was an original. And we had a dinner party with uh, some very close friends. I was fortunate enough to uh, inherit a real fancy place for a night that mm -hmm. I got to throw a free dinner for a bunch of friends. Yeah. And I invited them all over, and I thought, well, it's never going to get better than this. <laughs> so here we go. I stood, and I tinked my little wine goblet there after dinner and uh, said I've composed some poetry, and I recited it to them, and in the poem was the uh, proposal. I got it on videotape. Uh, neat. Yeah. An old romantic, too. See, yeah, oh, you all bet. kinds of different stuff you about bet. you. You bet. Oh, yeah. I even memorized the poem that night. Which so, uh, all right. Huh? Uh, you said... No, you, I mean, the, yeah, back... The, that was three years ago, but... Uh, yeah, sure. I, I was real proud of it. I've, I've written her uh, tons of poetry. As a matter of fact, back when we were in love, now that we're old married folks, you know... <laughs> I send her flowers on her birthday. <laughs> and, you remember her birthday? Uh, February 23rd, I think. Yeah, God, I hope it is. You can go home tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm right. <laughs> All right, we'll take some more calls. You're on the Eagle. Go ahead. Thanks for holding. And then dial your operator. Oh, they already went away. How did I, they do that? Yeah, that's the only girl I won't talk to on the phone, that one, I think. <laughs> You're on the Eagle. Moe. Yes, sir. How are you doing, guy? I'm doing good. How are you? Ah, pretty good. Moe, a lot of people talk about DJs. You know, they come in, they work three or four hours, and they're gone. What an easy life. Give us an idea of what kind of schedule you keep. I mean, surely it ain't. I come in, work three or four hours, and I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No, really. There's got to be more to it than that. Oh, there is. I, uh, I get here about 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Tomorrow will be no exception. Well, it is, because I'm not going to leave, but... Um, uh, on a general day, I'll get here at 4.30 four, uh, in the morning, go on the air at eh, sometime between 5 and 5.30. They run some Best of Moby tapes between 5 and 5.30. Uh, Dibble will do a newscast at 5.20, and I'll generally be in the room by the time that newscast is over. Do the morning show till 9, which I really like that new schedule. But uh, then I'm generally here at the station till sometime between 11 and 12. Uh, lots of, uh, lots of times, some of our salespeople uh, will have... Lunch is arranged that they want me to do with potential advertisers that are skeptical of Moby. And they'll get them out, get, get me out with them and, and let them meet Moby and find out what this uh, nasty guy they've heard so much about but never really listened to is all about. And uh, that, that happens a couple of times a week. We have these munch with Mobys and everything. And, and sometimes we have practically nothing during the day. But... Still, even on those days, the next day's show has to be prepared, and as spontaneous as it might sound, believe me, there's a lot of preparation goes into it, and it's all done by your old pal, Mr. Moe, here. Uh, if it's, uh, it's, it's either like finding jokes or finding uh, offbeat news stories that I can make funny comments about, supposedly funny comments about. Can Kelly help or, you out at all? 
Yeah, she helps quite a bit, actually. She'll go through uh, the local papers that I don't see yeah. during the course of a day. She goes through USA Today for me. Uh, and, and I'll scan through the material that she's gotten plus what I've got myself. And, and, and it ends up taking at least two hours, sometimes three or four, to prepare the next day's show. So your, your three-hour morning show anywhere? Ends up being anywhere from, oh, say, a six or seven to a 10 or 12-hour day. That's what I figured. Keep up the good work, guy. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. Bye-bye. You're on the Eagle. Yeah, I was wanting to ask Moby how he got into flying. I, something I always wanted to do. Thank you for asking. Boy, I just, I love it. Uh, I've always wanted to do that. Uh, when I was six years old, doc, Dr. Irvin in Crossville, Tennessee, which was the doctor that brought me out of my mother's womb, took me flying. And I've been in mm. love with it ever since. And I never could afford it. And thank God in Sandusky Broadcasting, now I can. <laughs> and I drove by a flying school every day for the first six months I lived here. And, I mean, it was on the way to work. I could see it. Airport flying school off to the side of Addison Road. And I said, I am going to stop there one of these days. I swear I am. And I was down at my in-law's house in Angleton, Texas. They, were, they live fairly close to a little airport. And I went one afternoon back about Valentine's Day this past year. And uh, me and Kelly were down visiting them. Uh, and I, I went flying with a friend of mine that was down there that came and landed at that little airport. And I decided, I said, that's it. This was on Sunday, and the next day I called that flying school. And the, the day after that, the Tuesday, which was in the middle of February, February 17th, I believe it was, I took my first lesson, and I've been strung out on it ever since. I love it. I heard you jumped once, too. Jumped? I, I've jumped several times. I got about 15 uh, uh, free fall parachute jumps. And uh, eventually decided I'd probably gambling with a little more odds uh -huh. in my favor if I'm if I'm actually piloting the plane and don't plan on jumping out of it. You ever done aerobatics up in there? Uh, not with me at the helm. I, 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 have you, have I, you been I, up doing it? Before? Sure. Uh, God, I may, I may learn like how. like that in the world. Yeah. yeah, I've, yeah, I've yeah that one time. I tell you what, I would recommend that everybody go jump out of an airplane one time. Mm. That is the biggest thrill I've ever had. One time. One time. Kelly did it once. Did she? Yes, she did. On our on our first anniversary, this November will be two years ago, there was a place down uh, in League City, Texas, that uh, taught parachuting. And it was what they call AFF, Accelerated Free Fall Course. And you go and you take, uh, you take a class all day, and then at the end of the day, before sunset, you go up to 12,500 feet mm. and oh, it's a two mile, better than two miles and jump. And you got two guys with you. You're, you're falling in a three-man formation, and they're there in case you freak out or faint. Uh -huh. You know, they pull the ripcord for you, so at least you don't die. And uh, it uh, actually, it's 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 a thrill. It's 45 seconds of free fall on your first jump, and yeah, I think everybody should do that once. <laughs> okay, thanks, caller. All right, you're on the Eagle. Hi, Mr. Moby. How are you tonight? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just great. Thank you. Good. Are you naked? <laughs> no. I'm well, then quit talking dirty. Quit sounding nasty. I'm not talking dirty. No, wait a minute. You gave me a nudge just for having my voice. Ah, boy, I remember you. <laughs> I was putting her on tape saying all sorts of god-awful stuff. Mm -hmm. You ought to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mavell, I was wondering, on your show, you always have um, all these people uh, translate things in different languages. You like that? Yeah. Why do you do that? I just think it's pretty hip. I mean, uh, imagine this. Let's see. what I've, I've got one... Um, that this old boy is a regular listener of the show. His name's A.B. Khalil. He's an Egyptian. And I got him up here one day. I give him a Moby mug, and I got him to do me a, a little Egyptian tape saying, an Egyptian, get your lazy ass up. Now imagine being here, <laughs> you know, from Egypt, visiting, scanning the radio dial, and stumble on that. Would that freak you out? Yeah, that'd be great. If, if, if everything you were hearing was, was English everywhere and you were struggling to understand everything that was said, and all of a sudden on the radio, blank, here some, comes something clear as a bell that you understand. <laughs> and for everybody else, it's just six it seconds long. Ass out of bed. And Egyptian, yes. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I've got Egyptian, I've got uh, Spanish, I've got Portuguese. Yeah, I understand the Spanish. The only thing is that the Spanish one is kind of vulgar. I, w there's been a lot of discussion about that. You get different Spanish-speaking people, and you'll find differences of opinion with that. I mean, fluent Spanish-speaking people. You'll find differences of opinion about culo, cula. Right. Yeah. And you have to remember, if you're in Texas, and that one's kind of echo, but like I told you, if you ever need Spanish lessons, I'm <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, come over and play carnival. I'll see you later. <laughs> Thanks for calling. You're on the Eagle. <laughs> yes, I'd like to say that I've been an Eagle Eye for 13 years. All right. A mobidiot for uh, almost a year now. A mobidiot. Yeah. D does that term offend you? No, no. 
You know, yeah, I hesitate to call my listeners idiots, you know, and I really don't think that my listeners are idiots. Yeah. But I, I just think it's a, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a morning show listener. You're a mob idiot. Uh-huh. You know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't mean anything offensive by it, and I was just wondering if anybody was taking it wrong. Way to recognize members of the family. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm mobbing his mob idiots, you yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, now the question. All right. Okay, now I know that Dibble seems offended, you know, whenever you make some racial, I mean sexual jokes. Uh-huh. Have you ever actually offended her? No. Oh, no, she knows better than to be offended. I'd slap her through this wall over here. <laughs> no, actually, Dibble and I have been, you know, it, it, when you work with somebody that close, day to day, uh, you, you can't go through a five-day work week without a couple of times during that getting on each other's nerves occasionally. Mm-hmm. But basically, like I say, me and Dibble have been friends since 1981. Uh, I knew I liked her when I hired her. And uh, I'm directly responsible for her being here, and I knew she was very opinionated and very feministic, and that was exactly the kind of person I wanted on the morning show with me. Uh-huh. As as opposed to some snooty bitch that wouldn't talk to me, which is what I had before. Uh, she sounded kind of like that whenever she first started the first day. Boy, she sounded so like y'all are way below me. You know that? <laughs> way below you? No, no. Dibble's Dibble's just a. No, nah, wait a minute. What now? Uh, I think she is just. Uh, scared. She was she was real scared right at first because she hadn't been in radio since uh, oh god. In, in ages. She she had done radio before in Atlanta, but I knew she was a very smart girl. Uh-huh. I knew she had an excellent vocabulary. I knew her attitude was proper, and I knew that she could probably get her act together enough to uh, to pull this morning show news deal off. Uh-huh. And uh, it took her a little while to find her absolute feet, but no, you know, she, she's certainly very sec- secure of herself. She's self-confident. But, uh, as a matter of fact, her self-confidence far exceeds mine. You know, she, she's a real together girl. People really like her that know her personally. All right, caller, i got to move along. Thanks. We do? Yeah. I wasn't through talking about Dibble. <laughs> well, we'll talk about Michelle in just a minute here. <laughs> okay. you're, you're on the you got another guest you got to get on. Oh, I can't believe this. I feel like the 97th caller or something. Uh, I wanted to know, I uh, work in a nightclub, and uh, we had a band from Conroe, Texas here called Odessa. You don't work in the Million Dollar Saloon, do you? No, I'm oh, okay. Texas. Maybe it's a friend of yours. Right, okay. But anyway, we had a drummer, his name was Mark Hacker, and he said he had worked in a, a band with the Moby Eye mm-hmm. on a professional level or what. So he was telling me that you're a fantastic musician. Why didn't you pursue this? Well, I did a little bit. Uh, I brought my band up. Well, I, I call it my band because when we were together, we were called Mobility. But they were a band on their own right. And uh, let's see. The band was called Gotcha, I bet, that you had down there. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, the Gotcha Band might might have actually split up. But uh, I used to go out with a band, and we'd do Texas Bitch and a Scotsman song, and we'd do some Leonard Skinner, and we'd do some Charlie Daniels. And uh, the, the the band was wonderful to work with. Uh, we had a fiddle player in it and a couple of guitar players, and, and uh, it, it was fun playing with them. And once since I've been up here, uh, I brought the band up, and we played at the Autorama over in the uh, That's mar- right. over at Market yeah. Hall. And we played three shows over two days. Uh, had a ball with it. Uh, considering we hadn't been together in about six or eight months at that time, I thought we came off pretty good with uh, what limited rehearsal time we had. And uh, But beyond that, it's it's really a lot of trouble to do that. And it takes almost more time than I, I care to get it. But uh, it, if, if another booking came along, I can't say that it would never happen again. But Kid Craddock's got a band now, and I wouldn't want to do anything to, uh, <laughs> to, to put us in a competitive stance. Uh, one more question. Uh, whenever you made the transition from a country station to a rock station, was that really very difficult? Or <laughs> Do you, you listen to my show? <laughs> it was exactly the same. The records were different. That's all. Are you serious? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. okay, that's all. All right, thanks. Let's call. You're on the Eagle. Hi, I want to say hello to Moby and that I've been a listener since Houston time. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think you're doing a great job. Um, I have a question for you about Kelly. What does she do as a profession? Well... Actually, right now, she's the uh, vice president and bookkeeper of Moby Enterprises Incorporated and custodial engineer and uh, <laughs> industrial engineer and domestic engineer at Bendover Acres up at the house. Uh, when I met her, she was, you've heard of Sackowitz uh-huh. that went belly up here. She was the uh, assistant promotion director for the entire chain of Sackowitz stores uh, at, at age 22. She was a sharp cookie. Oh. Does she ever think she'll get into something like that again? Probably when Jonah gets to where he potties on a regular basis in that little <laughs> deal instead of in his diaper. Because I'll, I'll change it occasionally. But <laughs> Do you think she'll ever go on the radio with you? Oh, I put her on on the phone occasionally. Yeah, I've heard that occasionally, but I didn't know if she'd go for like a day or something. Are you kidding? Of 
that'd be interesting. I'm married to her. Now I don't have to work with her, do I? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, and you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. All right. Let me, let me just ask you. You're, what, 34? I will be. I'm not yet. December. I am old. He's not even going to be 34 until December. That's right. What do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I'd like to hang in rock and roll radio for a while. Stevens and Pruitt were here, you know, for how long? Four or five years. Yeah. Uh, Jim, or uh, Mark Stevens is, geez, 50 or thereabouts. And still, still rocking his socks off yeah, even t- tomorrow morning. Believe me, he's sound asleep right now because he's got to get up at 4 o'clock in the right. morning, too. Those guys are still working and working in rock and roll. I, I don't want to hang with rock and roll that long. I'd like to rock and roll till I'm old 40 or so. And then I'd like to kind of lay back, get me an afternoon or early evening job on, uh, oh, I don't know, some country station, something. I don't care. And uh, j- just get into uh, a less competitive, less high-pressure pressure situation. You want to own one of these things? Own a radio station? Mm-hmm. No, thank you. No, thank you. I've seen Norman Rao in action, and that's not my <laughs> lifestyle. He's finally tanned his way to the top as president of the Lucky Sperm Club, and I am glad to see it. I do not want to own one. All right. Listen, I really, really want to thank you for being here tonight. No problem. He stayed up late with us, mm-hmm. and I know that uh, at 4.30 he will be awake anyway, because that's what happens when you... Because uh, I'm going to leave, leave a little note up here that tells uh, Tanya Chase who will be on it five o'clock in the morning to come make make coffee and wake me up mm-hmm. okay but i again i thank you well thank you for having me richard all right good, yeah, Moby, good time be on the radio in the morning uh <laughs> six o'clock you no five five, five thirty yeah five thirty well, well, five thirty shortened the shift right. and yeah mm-hmm. opened it up a little bit earlier right. i see that's right all right five thirty to nine tomorrow morning moby will be here thanks y'all for listening but you didn't ask me if i'd ever been arrested you ever been arrested yeah, as a matter of fact, Rich, I, gosh, I was hoping he wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> yeah, Tell you this one more story, and then I'll go. <laughs> Have you ever been flying with Jim Pruitt? No, uh, don't. no, but especially yeah, in you Mexico. know, fat kids in high school dances really didn't mix, Rich. <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, uh, th- these guys got on me enough to, before I finally went to this dance, right? Yeah. In high school, it wasn't a prom or anything. It was just an after a ball game dance in the gym. Well. There was this girl, there was a group of little girls, and they always like to pick on the fat kids, right? They got the yeah. prettiest girl to come up and ask me to dance. Yeah. And how do you say no? <laughs> it's okay, I'll dance with you. Well, this was in 1970. The bump was popular. Mm-hmm. My ass is three feet wide, man. I put her in the third row. They got me for attack with a deadly weapon. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs>